when did what age did you learn that you were white when was that ever conveyed to you or when did you learn of your race i'm just curious just share that in the chat i'm going to share my story i was um gosh, i think it was first grade um and I was in an old elementary gym that was also used as the cafeteria. And I, I was walking across and I looked up on the stairs and I, and I saw a um, black classmate and it was the first black classmate that I had ever seen or ever had. And she was sitting on the stairs. And if you know anything about Hendersonville, there's certain parts of Hendersonville um, where I grew up that are a little um, of the countryside. And I would say that I went to the country um, school and she was there all by herself. And, and I'm walking by and I was just, I was struck. I, I didn't know. And I remember going home and probably talking about it. Um, and, and that was probably the first time that I was ever made aware, like, oh yeah, there's, there's black people in our world or there's um, Latinx or there's Asian. And um, it was just this very surface level, top level, not really deep conversation. Okay, Nathan, go eat your dinner type of thing. Um, it was, it was just really hurried. Um, but I understood then, um, that I was white and then, um, it's something that still churns and, um, wrestles and in my heart and in my spirit. Um, Ray, um, I'm just, I'm just curious when you hear that, um, excerpt from that book written, um, what comes to you when, when were you first made good or bad, um, aware of your race yeah i mean i <clears throat> i don't know that i can point to a time like she did um you know for me i you know i think for better or for worse i grew up in a very much predominantly black neighborhood uh my elementary school was um predominantly what predominantly black middle school predominantly black high school predominantly black I, did, I don't recall having like this real kind of like, whoa, I am, not that I, I've always known I was black, that's not the, the, the point, but kind of the difference was, was the, 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 the big, I think, whoa, wow, I'm, I am a minority, it happened for me in college. I went to uh, John Wesley College in High Point. I was one of three black folks um, at the time, and it wasn't you know that long ago, it was in 2001 or two. Um, and that was the first time I remember being a minority in school, right? Uh, and it wasn't a, and even that wasn't this traumatizing experience, but it was the first time I was like, yo, I am definitely not in Greensboro anymore. Like I'm not in East Greensboro with everyone who, who knew me. So I, I think that was a, a big part. Uh, I've, 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 I've had experiences where, you know, I have been, it's been made known to me how different I am. I, I, I do go back. I will say this. The, th the thing I go back to, I went to a, while well, my high school was probably black, the youth group I went to was probably white. And I remember being, um, I was in 11th grade, I think. And we were, there was, I was take, helping at the end, taking trash out. And we had to come back in and it was dark. And uh, I knock on the door and this guy says, um, I can see your eyes and your teeth, but who is that? He said this as a joke, like this was, this was something funny, like because I'm black and it was dark and all he could see were my eyes and my teeth. And I was like, he thought that was a joke, like that was supposed to be funny. He's like, oh, come on, man, you know, you know I don't see color. When, and he, this guy and I ended up being uh, college roommates too, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's my experience. Yeah, and, and that's something that was that's continued and probably persisted is that enculturation of I don't see color. You know, color is something that we're we're not supposed to see. Color is something that can, um, you know, that, that, that's that separation thing, and we're not supposed to see that, especially as the church, right? We we are all supposed to see. Hey, we're coming together. We 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 see this happening. I think in the um, in the wake of, and I mean that in the true sense of the wake of George Floyd's death and the, and like the wrestling and the troubling that that has caused, um, that there has been numerous accounts that people have, I've heard said, um, 
on radio or TV or um, individuals talking about, I just don't see color. I, I just, I just don't get it. I'm, I'm, I wasn't raised to see color. And, and what does that do when people um, go into that space in their heart and their head? I'm going to read a quote real fast. I want to hear what you have to say to that, Ray. Um, and it's by Michelle Alexander. And if you guys have not read the new Jim Crow mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness, please get yourself a copy. Um, it's, it's incredible. It's super worthwhile. Anyway, she, she says colorblindness though widely touted as the solution is actually the problem. And Nathan, yeah. I was going to um, point out in the comments, we actually got a, a, a lot of folks um, commenting about, and a lot of it was when they, when they moved, when they, it, it seems like people either moved to a different community, um, they moved to a different state or a different school, you know, and those kind of, again, they sort of lived in a, in a place of, um, sameness or it, it wasn't until they shifted their um, perspective that, that changed. We have, um, or like Debbie Cole said, when someone else, an Asian, um, young Asian girl moved into our community so that she saw something different for the first time. So I think it's that sort of the eye opening. Mm. Um, but Cynthia Lank talked about being six and when she saw the white and colored sign on water fountains. So, you know, yeah. there's still that very obvious. There was literally a sign yeah. um, that she was, white a troubling sign indeed yeah I think, blindness. Uh, what's that i said so color blindness though widely touted as the solution is actually the problem yeah you know i think it's uh it's an interesting thing uh color blindness because it it i think it's like a lot of things come from a space of uh, like a good space, right? I, I think when, when some folks say, well, you know, I don't see color, it isn't a thing of, you know, I think it's their way of saying, I try to be as objective and unbiased as possible. But when I hear a person say they don't see color, um, I, the, the, the thing I want to say is, no, friend, I want you to see color. I want you to regard color. I want you to regard my color. I want you to regard uh, color of, of different people. Um, the the not seeing color is, I believe, and, and I, I don't want to get ahead of us, but not seeing color is an easy answer to a very complicated and deeply seated problem, right? Uh, so if we can, because when we say we don't see color, there there is a standard, right? Um, there is a standard. So when 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 we say we don't see color, what we are actually saying, whether I believe, from my perspective, whether we know it or, or not, what we're saying is, I have a standard. This is the standard, and I'm not realizing that the thing is based on something. Is based on color. Is based on culture. Is based on a worldview. Uh, but when we say we don't see color, we erase our differences. We um, force everyone to conform to whatever the plumb line is we've set, right? Um, and in, in America, that, that, that plumb line, that, that, that place, to, that, um, that measuring stick is often white culture, is often whiteness. Um, I think what we could say differently, instead of saying, I don't see color, is uh, we try to, is, is we can communicate that we don't allow color to be the thing that immediately turns us off, right? We don't allow color to inform our assumptions. We don't allow color to blind us, pun intended, right? Um, That's blind I mean. us, yeah, go ahead. No, it's, I mean, it's, you're getting to something that we named last week, which I think is so important and we'll continue, I'll probably um, come in. Um, they'll probably continue to um, inform this conversation and be named every single week is, is you, the, the whiteness, the Eurocentric, and I'll even go even further to this is the white male 
that has influenced so much of the westernized um, history into where we are now. And, and definitely that plays in, in a lot of our theology. It plays in a lot of um, the church as it stands as, as right here and right now. Um, it's formed that. Uh, Patricia Real Williams says, this is a dilemma. Being colored, so to speak, in a world of normative whiteness, whiteness being defined as the absence of color, the drive to conform our surroundings to whatever we know as normal is a powerful force. Convention in many ways is more powerful than reason and customs in some instances are more powerful than law. And he's talking about just that, like at what point um, and how have we gotten so astray from the Jesus that was not white, the culture that Jesus was raised in that was not predominantly white, um, to where we are now, um, where, where that white Jesus has so much um, you know, in that power and in that space, but our colorblind, I think it all ties together that we, we want to just have that Eurocentric whiteness as that's our normative. That's what we know. That's what's claimed to know. And that's also what's been so harmful. Um, I see you're, you're about to pop with something to say, so go for it. <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think um, there is whiteness itself is very powerful, right? And we, we know, I mean, I don't know. I shouldn't say we know. Uh, there is discussion, especially among sociologists, reminding us about race and how, like what race is. We, we, we realize that race is something that was just, for want of a better term, really kind of made up, right? Like we, we know that, you know, there was a time where uh, folks being Irish was important, folks being Italian was important, but somewhere along this this uh, especially in our in our history as Americans, uh, we've that's all become white, right? It's all become whiteness, and you've had to assimilate to a specific standard, right? So you're you're you weren't Irish American, you're white, and um, and when we don't see color, when we don't see differences, we have to conform to the standard, and then the standard becomes some version of whiteness, right? Um, I, and again, I, I can't stress enough, I think when folks talk, a, a lot of people, not everybody, I think when a lot of folks talk about being colorblind, um, what they are saying is something different than what's actually happening. Um, we don't need folks to be colorblind, right? We, we need people to see color because that's important. We are all, each of us, made in God's image. So each of us, with all of our, our differences, are part of the, the beautiful tapestry that is our God. And so it isn't, you know, we shouldn't seek to become colorblind. We should seek to become color conscious and recognizing mm -hmm. the, 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 the light in you, the light in me, and recognizing that each of us have this, we are, we are knitted and formed in the very image of God. And, and all of us, represent a piece of who it is to be human, right? All of us make up humanity, and each of us are image bearers of God in all of our differences. And even our differences, um, uh, not just our, our color, but our cultural differences, right? And those things are, are not liabilities. Those things are part of who we are. And so for me, as a, as a person who isn't white, right, who don't, who, 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 who does have melanin, it's, I want you to see my color because it's beautiful. I want you to see my culture because it's beautiful and it's different from yours. Just like um, I am learning from you, you can learn from me and we can have these discomforting conversations that are full of so much angst, right, and uh, and paradoxes and uncertainties, those things make us who we are. They inform who we are. And if we don't have to, if, if whiteness isn't the standard, if it isn't the plumb line, and we can say, yes, 
your whiteness is beautiful because that's who you are. You were made this way, but it isn't the only beautiful way. My blackness is beautiful because that is who I am. I, made in the image of God, you, made in the image of God, are each these beautiful people, and we figure it out. We figure out how to acknowledge our differences because, again, uh, it's easy for us to just say there is no color because it means we, uh, we don't have to acknowledge the friction, <laughs> you know, it's the friction is still there. We just don't have to acknowledge. Frankly, the friction is still there, but saying we're colorblind frees, um, especially our white siblings, uh, from some of the discomfort. Right? Uh, you don't have to deal with it, but we do. Right? You can if you can say I don't see color, and that's fine. You can say that, but it's a luxury I don't have because I wake up every day and see this beautiful melanin uh, for which I give God thanks. Right? Um, but also for folks who don't see it, you don't have to, even if you don't have it, you don't have to deal with or, or wrestle with or struggle through, um, the differences for whatever reason that melanin, um, causes. Yeah, Ray, I, Ray, this is John Clarkson. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe at one point the Irish the Italians and Jewish folks were not considered white, but exactly. actually legislation was enacted that made them white. Am I correct about that? You are very correct about that, John. Um, thank you. That that you're very correct. I mean, again, it's a construct. It's it's, and it was also based really on survival. I remember, you know, I mean, you all remember. Um, I don't know. You remember no Irish need apply. I remember I taught um, history for one single year, but I, I loved American history. And I remember um, that, that being a thing that, you know, the Irish were, were really mistreated. They were not um, well regarded, but um, be, be, because they were different, because they were, were the outsiders. And um, I mean, Michelle Alexander talks about this a little bit in her book, uh, The New Jim Crow, which is really, really good. And I, I encourage everyone to read it. But she talks a bit about this construct that has become race and what was behind it, especially relative to causing the disunity between um, white working class folks and um, black folks when it came to banding together. But if we can, you know... I, Anyway, so that's that, that's getting off, off track, but I would encourage you to read the book. But yes, John, you're correct. Yeah, it's good. Um, I don't think it's getting off track at all. The, um, I think it really gets to what Patricia Williams says again. Um, she says, I believe that racism's hardy persistence and immense adaptability are sustained by a habit of human imagination or the lack thereof. Um, deflective rhetoric and hidden license. And, and what I love about that is um, so often we want to turn to that deflective rhetoric that we just, oh, I, I'm colorblind or oh, I don't see the issues in this or it's somebody else's fault. Or uh, I think the most thing, most common thing that I've heard of deflective rhetoric right now um, is the black on black crime argument that continues to pour forth. Um, and then that's one side of the mouth and the other side of the mouth is I don't see color. And it's like, you know, this isn't really working, folks. Um, one, it's an extremely racist comment to make the comment that um, it's black on black crime. You know, this crime happens, crime, yes, we get that, but you can't just go ahead and deflect into that rhetoric. Um, I want to dive into a little bit of Keen. Well, wait, can I jump in there real quick, yeah. Nathan? Yeah. I, I do think it's important. Um, I, I don't know that the question itself is inherently racist or, or, or posing the black on black crime theory is inherently racist. I believe it is ignorant, and mm. um, because you know, you would be right to say that there is a lot of black on black crime, but you would also be right to say that there is a lot of white on white crime. You would also be correct to say there is a lot of Native American. Why? Because we live in segregated in a segregated society, mm. and most most crime happens within your community, right? So a lot of folks, it's easy to look at the numbers and say there's tons of black on black crime. There is tons of 
uh, most people are harmed by a person who looked like them. This is true almost across the board. The lowest numbers um, um, uh, would be for folks who are mixed race, and then after that are Asian folks um, um, who are not, it, you won't have necessarily the same kind of crime, but most people are hurt or killed by a person who looks like them, right? So yes, there's black on black crime, but what it does is it's, 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 uh, those arguments and the all lives matter, those arguments aren't bad per se, and they're not wrong per se, but what they do is they deflect, right? They take the, they take the attention away and they what about the, the, the deal? It's the same thing with colorblindness. Colorblindness in theory sounds good. It sounds even goal worthy. But what it does is it shifts the, it shifts the focus away from getting to a place where no, it isn't that we have to put on blinders. No, it's that we are wide awake and saying in spite of these differences, yes, because of these differences, we're going to be more. It is harder. It is harder to be color, color conscious. It is harder to, to, to deal with the underlying issues always. Um, but I believe that's the work, that hard work is the work that we're called to do, not only as decent people, but especially as followers of the way, as followers of Christ, of, of being people who certainly sees this beautiful person in front of you. And, 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 and again, it isn't a thing of us trying to make, I, I, I imagine for my white siblings especially, it, this time feels weird. It feels like, uh, like there are just these tectonic plates hitting and everything is shifting and changing. Everything you thought was mm -hmm. right is now being called wrong. Everything you thought you knew, folks are saying no. And it has to be so jarring. And I want to acknowledge that it probably is. And I want to acknowledge that it's probably going to be even more so. But friends, I, call, I just want to encourage you to stick in this ride, to figure this out together, to not pull back because of discomfort, but to lean in and to say, I do not understand this. I, one day I think I'm doing something right and then somebody else telling me I'm wrong and, 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 but stick with it because it's worth it. And it's, I believe that hard work that we're called to do Again, not only as decent people, but certainly as followers of Christ, little disciples trying to, as best we know how, emulate our Christ, right? Um, yeah. I only have a week left, friends, so I'm, I'm sorry for preaching just then. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, it gets, us, I mean, it gets us to our TED Talk that we had, right? Talking about being colorblind or color brave. Um, so we're going to dive into that in the second half, some of those conversations and concepts. But I want to give um, space to just kind of breathe for a moment um, and to process what you've heard so far. And if there's any um, burning question or something on your heart, a statement that you would like to make, um, please put it in the chat um, so that we can attend to it. So let's take about 30 to 45 seconds. Um, Process, reflect, share if you want anything answered. And I'll say that Tom and um, Ray did just address this. Tom um, Murdoch had asked about color blindness. Is that a, is that something we aspire to, or something you know? And so I think that's exactly what um, Ray just addressed. That really yeah. is kind of we're trying to aspire to be different than that. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that question. That's a really good question. I love James' uh, response. I saw James responded to it. Um, as well. I, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think our goal should be color conscious. Um, we should not, as, I think, I think, Tom, I don't, I don't want to presume to know what you were, I mean, you, you wrote what you said, but I, I think behind your question could be, should we uh, aspire to a place where the idea behind color blindness is right. Um, I think we we can aspire to become decent people who really are uh, looking at the person in front of us and making judgment judgments based on what they've done and not based on our assumptions about what they've done. I, I don't believe there's anything wrong with that, um, Tom, at all. Um, 
But I, I think. If I could, could I? Uh, my my concern, I guess, is that there are other attributes like height, uh, economic status, intelligence, concern for other people. I just think at some point when we look at someone, we won't think so much of their color as we will. Oh, he's the one that helped that person in the store the other day. So it won't be so much. Oh, he's one of those African Americans. No, he's he's a very. It's just a different attribute, you know. I I think we're so used to having so much about you know color orientation that we forget that that's that doesn't have to be the norm. I hear that. I don't believe that it has to be the norm, but I don't believe either. I, here here's what. I believe if we get to a place where we start looking at other attributes, it, it's, I think colorblindness is a proxy for whiteness being the standard, right? Uh, and we have, when we talk about Americans, for instance, we're, what we're talking about are white, is whiteness, right? And so I think that's what, what, what gives me a little pause, um, Tom, is, is, is I, I don't want the standard to be, I will, we shouldn't make the standard being decent, right? Um, and being, especially in our faith tradition, um, emulating Christ, but we don't want for whiteness to be the only, or at least I don't believe we, we should, uh, whiteness to be the standard as it is currently, whether we acknowledge that or not, right? And I, and, I, and I don't think you disagree with that, but I just said it. I, I, I didn't start. I mean, hasn't President Trump underlined that whiteness is the norm? And if you divert that, that's a problem. We've got to deal with that, right? Explicitly. Right. <laughs> I'm not touching any of that, James. I'm not doing it. <laughs> What's that deconstruction work that we have to do? We have to deconstruct that um, the white normative um, and see people um, growing away from that. Uh, Jason put in the chat, um, which I think is one of the um, strong quotes for the night so far, is we got to grow away from colorblindness to color consciousness. Um, and the more we are conscious of one another in that deep appreciation, you, you do begin to see that God and neighbor you do get begin to see and appreciate fully um what we hear so beautifully written um poetically so in genesis 1 26 through 27 it's that um we are image of god bearers um and that's if we can start to be, um, believe and understand that we can see the image of god in every single one of our neighbors and understand the beauty in that um i think there's a lot of dissolving of the barriers and I would say fear, um, and this is something I wanted to get into a little bit um, in this latter half or latter quarter, um, is how much of that color blindness do you think, Ray, and that, that space is coming from fear um, and fear of the other or fear just in general? Yeah, I don't know that any, many of us would be able to name it fear, and that's a really good question. And that, I see Seth's uh, comment here, which I think is really good here. Um, Seth says, I think the statement of not seeing color comes more from our childhood when we actually didn't know the difference. The verb is definitely misguided as we get older. However, the intention is still important and should not be lost or easily dismissed. And, and I don't disagree uh, at all with that. I, I think when we were younger, it isn't even that we were color blonde, we weren't color, we, we, we weren't, we didn't have the experiences which shapes our biases. And so all we could do is see the person in front of us and were they nice to us, they're my friend. Were they mean to me, they're not my friend. I do believe this, this won't for color blindness, just like many things is rooted though, Nathan, in fear, right? Not necessarily 
this again thing that we would name as fear, but it's it's it isn't so much even so much fear of the person in front of you. It's from for, like the only way I know how to explain a lot of issues relative to race is to explain how I feel when I'm talking with my siblings who are of a different um, gender or, or orientation than me. Sometimes I don't want to look stupid and ask the wrong question. I don't want to for them to think I'm something that I'm not. So sometimes I don't ask the question and I would rather them kind of not make me feel this discomfort, right? Not make me feel like I'm a bad person. So I want them to really conform to me. I think that's the fear, not so much of the fear of the person, but the fear that we're going to get it wrong. The fear mm -hmm. that somebody's going to think we are prejudiced or racist or, or, or whatever the thing is. And so we'd rather not even face it. We'd rather them just conform. Whether we can, whether we would articulate it that way or not, I believe uh, sometimes that's, that's what's happening, right? Like those are the things that are that are going on if that's making sense yeah does that make sense i feel like i said a lot there seth seth i'd love to hear your perspective on uh from your question i love that i love your response in the chat like did i did i gather what you were saying correctly or did i misrepresent anything you said no that that was correct yeah thank you yeah so we, what you're what you're getting at, and I'm hearing and feeling, Ray, and correct me too if I'm wrong, but we're really talking now about um, what Melody Hobson was saying in her TED talk of understanding um, colorblind or being color brave, mm. and, and we've discussed so much about color blindness up until this point, um, and and to some degree, I'm um, talking about color brave, um, and I wanted I want us to kick to scripture real fast. Um, and Acts 8, 26 through 40. Um, I won't read it to us, but it's the very familiar story of Philip encountering the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, now, in scripture, when we're reading this, we don't, we don't hear, it, it, and it's not written, where it's not saying that Philip encountered a, um, a money carrier for the queen. We don't hear that it was the treasure is very specifically written an Ethiopian eunuch um, and to the point of gender identity and all that we can we can spend so much time on this conversation uh, of this particular um, beautiful scripture um, and perhaps we will in the later conversation series um, but it specifically names Ethiopian and if you go back into the Hebrew scriptures um, you, you look throughout and you go to Numbers 12 and you have the Cushite wife of Moses. Um, Joshua um, chapter 2 beginning there through the sixth chapter. You have Rahab and the Canaanites. You have Ruth and the Moabite and Ruth. You, um, you have the Cushites and Jeremiah. Um, you have all these folks who are named for who they are um, in their ethnic groups. Um, and Ray touched on this a little bit tonight, and we named a tiny bit of it last week too, but race is a social construct. It's, it's something that um, was, it was not, it's not the same as, as ethnicity and everything, but all I'm trying to get to is my point um, is that the scripture doesn't, it doesn't skirt away from, it doesn't shy away from naming Ethiopian eunuch, doesn't shy away from saying Canaanite, doesn't shy away from Jesus at the well meeting the Samaritan woman. It just doesn't say this woman who had multiple wives. It, it identifies her. It gives her agency. It gives who she is. Um, and let's get it back to Genesis 1:26 through 27, who she is, who these people are, who the Ethiopian eunuch are, our beloved children of God. And they are seen for their worth. They're seen for their identity. They're seen for um, everything that God has created them to be. And that's beautiful and wonderful. Um, due to our fallenness, due to who we are and who we are trying to continue to be in um, searching our way to perfection um, and good in there, stumbling or um, doing better than others at times, we, we have to work on that. We have to work it out to understand um, and we have to be able to be color brave in this situation. Um, and I, I, love, I love what Melody says. I, I love how she really dives into 
um, being able to be brave parents, uh, the parents who are on here, grandparents who are on here, um, understand that colorblindness is definitely a learned behavior. And she, in her talk, talks about, hey, teachers, parents, um, aunts, uncles, um, father figures, mother figures, um, whoever you might be, you've got to be proactive in your conversations with, honest, with honesty and courage. Uh, and she goes on to say, it's because it's the smart thing to do. Um, and I would, I would stretch that a bit to say it's the Christian thing to do, to, to meet it head on, not to shy away from it, to not skirt around it, to own that who we are and who we're connected to be. Um, I'm going to read again um, from our dear friend Patricia Williams' book here, um, something that influences and goes along with this. Then Ray, um, whatever you've heard me say, you want to respond with. She says, a wall begins to grow around the forbidden gaze of race. For we all know, and children best of all, when someone wants to change the subject forever, and so the child is left to the monstrous creativity of ignorance and wild imagination about race. Yeah. You know, that's good. I I don't, I don't know that we can point to anything. Um, so J James Baldwin said, um, not everything that is, um, not everything that is faced can be, oh, bless it. Not everything that is faced can be fixed, but nothing can be fixed unless it's, faith, uh, unless it's faced. Now I'm paraphrasing, I'm getting it wrong. But the idea is, we have to always face, we have to always tackle things head on. You know, ignoring things has never worked. Um, you know, ignoring the fact that you have some, you know, you might have a, you need to go to the doctor and then you just ignore it, ignore it gets worse and worse. It never gets better. You know, a, a festering sore must be, Dr. King said, must be exposed to the, to the sunlight uh, for medicine. It, it's the same thing with race and, and the conversation around colorblindness. We must be brave enough to acknowledge our differences. Not only is it wise, I think it's the honoring thing to do, right? It's the thing that says, you matter enough for me to see all of you. It says that we are we are going to push through the hard stuff um, to get to a space where we see each other, where we really see each other, warts and all, as they say, right? And so uh, when we are brave, when we acknowledge our differences, when we acknowledge that we have work to do, I think we're, we get farther along that work of creating the beloved community. But when we ignore it by going to the familiar place of colorblindness or going to the familiar place of assimilation, right? Because that's something else we could spend some time talking about is when we colorblindness, again, makes the standard whiteness and then what does even that mean it means we you know here in the south we have a way um you know there's a whole culture of being in the south like that's the thing i am a a very much very much a southerner i love being from the south i love what makes southerners southerners right i love that we are we can throw shade but we can love on you and bring you in at the same time um it, when we are you know, so so the, the the reality is like culture is is a part of the conversation. Uh, some standard is a part of the conversation. But when we are brave, we say, "You are my friend, all of you. You are my sibling, all of you. All of your culture, all of your color, and we're going to figure out this thing in community together." And it's brave for us to tackle that as opposed to going back to the familiar conversation of colorblindness. Yeah, let me get in on that. 
um, this great quote by a Naomi Murakawa, um, who's the author of The First Civil Right, How Liberals Built Prison America. She says, if the problem of the 21st or the 20th century was, in W.E. Du Bois' famous words, the problem of the color line, then the problem of the 21st century is the problem of colorblindness. The refusal to acknowledge the causes and consequences of enduring racial stratification. Mm. It's so good. Ooh, that is good. Sorry, I just read Fritz. Uh, Fritz, uh, can we talk about the parallels that exist between uh, color blindness and stereotypes? And we have five minutes. Um, uh, gosh, I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, it's we can be colorblind because I believe we can be colorblind because we I know I keep going back to this. We have a standard, and the standard is whiteness, and everything else is judged based on that, right? It's how we form our stereotypes, right? Um, and because there has to be a standard from which somebody is deviating. Right, so um, in the South, it's a stereotype that we like watermelon and fried chicken, but it's also a stereotype that Black folks like that. I'm like, no, I like those things probably more because I'm Southern than because I'm Black, because most every Southerner on this call would say, yeah, I love watermelon and I love fried chicken, right? But if you start getting, if you start getting even further into it, we, stereotypes are based on a lot of stereotypes come from a space of fear because we don't know is from ignorance, right? Not knowing. And so our stereotypes, uh, we, instead of us having the brave conversation of asking our, our, our sibling, like, what is this? Help me understand this. We make a childish, and I'm saying that not in, in, to be, not in the pejorative, but we make, a, we make a childish assumption that then informs everything we see about, about kind of those people, right? So we make assumptions about things. The same thing with when we're colorblind, when we, when we say we don't see color, it's again, it's because we really do, we have a standard that everybody else has to fit. Um, and then we, it frees us from the, it frees us from the obligation of going deeper. And that's also what stereotypes do. Stereotypes free us from getting to know people. Stereotypes uh, make us, feel like we know a person without ever getting to know them. It, stereotypes tell us that we know who this person is informed by something that has either happened to us in the past by this person or has never happened to us, but happened to somebody in proximate to us, like our family, our parents, who told us about these people. So we make these stereotypes about Asian folks or about white folks or about southern folks or about northern folks based not on us our lived experience with them but the experience of someone else right and all of those things i believe from my in my opinion are based are come out of a space of of ignorance and or fear yeah sorry if that was too much no it's good it's <clears throat> back to that bindingness of fear um, I, I say often about fear. Fear is so um, intoxicating and it just captures you in and it's hard to get out of that and it's hard to break forth from the fear. So Ray, I want to say thank you so much for tonight and helping us break forth um, from some fear. Um, Ray, if you'll do us a favor, if you are okay with this, um, to pop your email in the chat. Um, or everybody, um, Britt will put our emails in the chat, um, our missions office email. If there's anything that's um, spoke to your heart that you sleep on and reflect on tonight um, from this incredible conversation, please email us. Um, please let us know. Um, that way we can um, do justice by these conversations and share where we need to share as well. Um, put my personal email address in there because again, I don't have a work one yet. I do, but yeah. There you go. Um, so I think one thing that I want to just remind us all of um, tonight is the the work that it takes um, and the 
the work that we must do and the work that we know what to do as white people um, to really make the effort going forward to change. Um, and one last um, quote um, reading from good old Patricia Williams. Um, she says, this contemporary seesawing between the capitulation to a sense of inevitable doom and colorblindness and racism is usually met by an idea to quick fix. And in that, I am very suspicious. And I am too. Um, this is not going to be a quick fix. This isn't going to be something that we can just flip a switch on and it's all over and we've moved on and we've gone forward. Um, God willing, I wish that was the case, but friends, that's not. Um, but what is the case is the 40 plus people who are on this um, time with us have an opportunity and dare I say an obligation um, to make a difference, uh, to close the gap between the way things are and the way they ought to be according to God's kingdom so that we can see um, God's kingdom realized here on earth. Um, we think about Revelation and talking about who all is going to be joined together at the heavenly banquet. We, we say it when we have um, communion. We really, really mean it. <laughs> it's not something that we just flippantly get up and say and um, do. It's something that really is powerful and meaningful for us. Um, and so realize that this isn't going to be quick fix, but you can fix yourself. You can do that personal work that will lead to your family work, that will lead to the communal transformation, that will lead um, broader and broader and broader. Um, so I, I pray for you to do that. I pray for you to engage in that personal work um, as we move forward together, as we are better together. Um, and so... I'd love to turn to Uyan now, um, who is with us, and for him, if he doesn't mind, um, to close us with prayer. All right, friends, let's pray. Spirit of the living God, um, we are one family, uh, and we are different, and even at times divided, yet we are one family. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're the same, but it all means that we're beloved. So we're grateful for our brothers and sisters, near and far, similar and different. Um, we are grateful because we are beloved by you and we seek to love one another as you love us. Um, and in this broken world, you call us to be agents of peace and justice, uh, agents of truth, uh, to engage in uh, communities that may be different from our own, to have conversations that may challenge us and challenge the other. But in all things, you are there. Uh, you are there because you love us. You are there because your will be done. So we, uh, we are grateful for the, the, the work, this good work that you've given us to do together. We're grateful for uh, the many witnesses, um, including Ray today, but so many others who continue to shine light uh, onto the darkness. And we are grateful that we as Mars Park United Methodist Church, as God's community, can journey together to do this work together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, friends, thank you so much for um, being here this evening. Um, this is being recorded, and we will share it on our YouTube channel. So if you know somebody that wanted to be here but couldn't be here tonight, um, look for that in the next couple of days. We'll make sure that's available so that you can share. Um, next week, I will be joined um, by a, a somewhat familiar face. Um, his name is Reverend Howe. Uh, James and I are going to be uh, leading our conversation <laughs> on um, white privilege. So we um, want to see you here at eight o'clock mm -hmm. next week. Um, invite friends um, who you think will benefit from that, be troubled by that and challenged by that wonderful and needed conversation. So God bless you guys. See you tomorrow morning if you can at 830 for Bye. Ready, Set, Pray. Bye. All right. Bye, friends. Have Thank a good you. night. Thank, Thank you, Ray. You so much, Thank Ray. You. A pleasure. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Good luck, Ray. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Ray. All right. Bye. So. Are we going to...
All right. Who? Someone. Someone's iPad just entered the waiting room. Oh, I did that last. You're still recording. You can shut that off. <laughs>